So hello, everybody. Um, yes, as said, um, uh, my name is Tavi Kotka, or in English it should be David Eagle. So you can call me in this way. Uh, Kotka means Eagle. And um, I'm an engineer, so all my life I've been doing IT. Um, I was part of the team who built up the largest software development company in our region. And uh, yes, it's true, I joined the government because when I sold my shares, I got this non-competition thing. I couldn't compete in private sector. And uh, Estonia is a small country, 1.3 million people, so we all know each other, so we always meet each other in funerals and weddings. So they noticed that I might be unemployed, and then they said, like, please come and work for the government. Obviously, I said no, because if you are 33 and perfectly healthy, you don't work for the government. But uh, they were very persuasive, so uh, in the end of the day, I said, okay, why not, let's do it. And uh, I was lucky when I sold my shares, I got enough money, so I actually were able to afford to work for the government. So, to begin with, uh, just a reminder, where is Estonia? So, uh, it's the green one up there. Uh, it's the same latitude as Alaska. So, uh, 10 months every year, we have a very crappy weather. Uh, so that's why we are so good in IT. Because there is, there is nothing more to do than just sit uh, inside a house and program. That's why Skype and all other stuff comes from Estonia. So, uh, but it's very, actually it's a very important slide because it gives you the answer why Estonia is an e-country. So it's a small people-wise, 1.3 million people. But land-wise, land -wise, it's actually huge. It's bigger than Switzerland, it's bigger than Netherlands, it's bigger than Belgium, it's bigger than Denmark without Greenland. So uh, we actually share the same problem what every North European country has. It's the fact that many people live in rural areas and uh, private sector, they cannot afford bank office in every small town or the government, they cannot afford government officer in every village. So that's why we had to start pushing people to use internet. So when we broke apart from Soviet Union again in 1991, uh, and when we sorted out like the first legislation and stuff, it was quite clear that if you want to govern this country efficiently, we need to push people towards self-service. And that's why we started to develop all the services, and that's why we became the e-country. So it has never been a goal like, oh, let's have a 20 years uh, vision. Let's become an e-country. I mean, like, no, we had a pain, and we solved the pain, and solving the pain resulted becoming an e-country. So, and it's actually funny, I mean, like, to build a digital society, to build an e-government, if you give this task to the engineers, and if you say to them that, like, as a politician, I trust you, please do whatever you want to do. I'm not the politician, but I was one of the engineers, like, so, uh, like, Take the money and just come out with solutions you like. It's actually a, like heaven for an engineer. And uh, because building a digital government is actually a very straightforward thing. If you can remove the politics, it's just like putting together an engine. So there are certain parts, small parts, many, many, many small parts. You need to put them together. You need to add some oil and other liquids and boom, it works. The problem is like uh, sometimes it becomes political. So, I mean, in, in car industry, you don't say to the engineer like, maybe we shouldn't use a carburetor. But sometimes in government they say, I mean like, maybe we should not use unique identifiers. So somehow they are really smart in, in software engineering, but they are not so good at car engineering. But, in Estonia, lucky, we had the trust. And I think the reason is that, actually, I don't know. I, I don't know if the government was smart enough or thumb enough to trust engineers in the year 2000 and, and before that, because all the major initiatives were, were actually put in place back then. And I'm actually glad, currently working also partly for India, that uh, India is actually moving very well on the same directions where we were. And because it is a handbook, I mean, like, it's actually step-by-step -step things how you can create a digital society. It's like IKEA instruction. Just 
put the things together, and poof, you have a solution. But luckily, in the US, we have politics. And that ruins all. And then come back to that. So how we started? I mean, if you start pushing people to use internet, the first question is, who is behind the device? How can I be sure like, like who is using the device? And you still struggle with this till now. I mean, that's the whole conference about. Um, so Estonian, what we did, we, start, we started copying others. So for example, first of all, we issued unique identifier system. So every Estonian has a unique identifier. That's my unique identifier. For Japanese people in this audience, this is my number. For Indians, this is Aadhaar. So 379, et cetera. So, and it's a meaningful number. So you can see it includes sex and my age and everything. And it's totally public. Everybody uses that. So it doesn't matter if I'm a customer or if I'm a patient or if I'm a citizen or if I'm a voter or if I'm like, wherever I'm, I'm, I'm somebody. I'm not David Eagle, I'm 379, etc. And you can understand what kind of power it gives like if everybody in private sector and government sector actually uses the same unique identifiers. You basically can combine any kind of data sets because everybody uses the same, 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 same unique identifiers. So you don't have the problem what you actually have here, for example, that John Smith in one system and John Smith in another system, how can you tell that they're the same John Smith? So we don't have that problem. And the whole North Europe doesn't have that problem. Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Norway. We have said unique identifier doesn't mean security. It just identifies. Security is built differently around it. So for that, for that uh, government started to issue digital identity. And uh, this is my digital identity. You can see the unique identifier is also there. Uh, it's also a travel document, so inside Europe I can travel with that. But obviously it has a chip, and you can do powerful, thing with, powerful, powerful things with that. So every meaningful portal, like any private sector government portal, uh, allows me to log in with my digital identity. I can use different carriers. So in the picture currently you have, we have the ID cards, but I actually use mobile ID because it's so much more convenient like, than, than having this card reader and, and, and laptop and stuff. Why not to use this? Or smart ID, which is not chip-based anymore, but app-based solution. So you can have different carriers, but the problem, point is that government issues digital identity. Estonian police issues every person an identity. We copied this solution from Finland. But we added enormous innovation on top of that. We made it work. <laughs> so, and how we made it work, we made it mandatory. So everybody in Estonia has to have digital identity. So passport is a voluntary thing. You may have passport, you may not have passport. You need passport only if you want to travel overseas or like to US or, or to Japan or Asia. You don't need passport to travel inside Europe. So if you don't plan to go out from Estonia or from European Union, ID card is good enough. So, but digital identity is a must have document, number one document in Estonia. Why? Because that's the only way how we can push you to use digital services and self services because that's the only way how we can govern the country. And obviously we added like different software on top of that, like, like digital signature. If you approach Estonia, for example, with paper contra contract, they get suspicious. They can't understand like why you use this old fashioned non-environment friendly method. I mean, come on, think about it. I, and I'm I actually, I, I'm talking about like a true digital signature, not the funky thing you have here in the US called Tokusain. I mean, <laughs> it's, <laughs> come on guys, like having a finger and doing something on a screen and saying that's a sign digital signature, you must be kidding me. I mean, you are the identity people, you know security, so uh, where are the pins? Very something that only you can, you know. So, uh, so Estonia, like, 
instead of printing out a document, let's say we, we want to do a contract. Can I use you? Like, let's do, we do a contract. So I print out the contract. I sign it. Then I invite DHL. Uh, it takes one week to get the contract here to US. You sign it. You also pay $100, and one week it gets back. So two weeks, 200 bucks, and we have a signature. Compared with Estonia, right click, sign digitally, email. Activate, open, signature, back. Two minutes, zero cost. And that's why our society thinks whenever somebody brings a paper contract, like, why? And there is the next question. Where do we actually store this contract? In a shoebox? Like, or you, oh, OK, you do a digital copy, and then you store it in the cloud, right? It's funny, right? <laughs> and I can still understand. I mean, I just signed uh, an investment. I'm, I'm, I'm also an Asian investor. So I, I just signed an investment contract using uh, DocuSign. I'm actually investing through my wife's company. She's the owner and uh, uh, member of the board. But she was in the garden. But it was DocuSign, so. It's not security. Digital signature has to be something that you can go court with, truly. That has a true power and cannot be cheated. Has a timestamp and everything. So observe that. But that's not the point. The point is the government guarantees that signature. So if you go to court and say that here, in this contract, this digital signature is a fake signature. I haven't given that. And I have still my ID card in my pocket, and I haven't given my pins to anybody. Estonian government takes liability up to 5 million euros. Has never been used. System is up and running since 2002. So 16 years, like zero cases. On the same time, we have every month in court somebody claiming this is not my physical signature. Because there are still some people who give the, the physical ones. So somehow, if you issue a true digital identification and like, identity, you actually build a more secure, a more trustworthy system. And it's simple, and it's elegant. And it gets even better. I mean. This is Estonia famous X road. The point is that we have in Estonia once only law, or like principle. It says that information can be asked from the citizen only once. So if one minister already has that information, another minister cannot ask it again from the citizen. They have to actually take it from the original source. So there's always only one single source of truth. And uh, I mean, like that's mandatory. They have to behave this way. And we can do that because everybody uses the same unique identifiers. So you can match and combine data. Don't picture this uh, because it's actually misleading. I mean, we draw, the, we, we draw this picture for politicians, so it looks good. I mean, there is no service bus. I mean, like, it's actually it's actually point-to-point -point connection. I mean, the real picture is, is this one. I mean, but if you show this kind of picture to politicians, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> you lose your finance. <laughs> so let's go back. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it's actually point-to-point -point connection. In every, in front of every instance, we have a security server, and that gives the understanding that you can be sure that, like, the request actually came from trustworthy source, and then if you respond, that you can be sure that the, uh, all the information, like the, the information transfer, is, is in encrypted, etc. So. Uh, so that's how it was built already the year 2000, and now we have the version 6 of that. So yeah, but that's the real picture. There are more than 900 different systems all together um, communicating. Obviously, I'm in US. If everything is connected, like 50% of the audience has this question. What about privacy, if everything is connected? What, is, what about data protection? What about GDPR? I personally like GDPR. And uh, what we have understood is that 
if we want to protect this system, I mean, I give, let's, let's do it this way. Do you know who has looked your patient records during the last half of the year? Can you check that in the US? Who has checked your health record? Why not? It's on paper. Do you know Michael Schumacher, the famous Formula One driver? I know that you are more the indie people here, but like a German. So he had a terrible accident uh, skiing, and he was treated in, in Swiss hospital, Swiss. So if something relates with security, it's Switzerland. So, um, but his patient record was leaked. How? Because it was on paper. And everybody nowadays has a phone with a camera, even the cleaning lady. Who took the pictures? Nobody knows. So how can you be sure that person, somebody looked your data without your permission? Compared with Estonia, everything is digital. All the patient records are digital. Why? Because we believe that um, if doctor have all my medical history, it actually leads to the better healthcare. So for example, if something happens with me in South Estonia, let's say I break a leg and I get treated and all the x-ray pictures and stuff, but I live in North Estonia. So a week later, I need to go and re-examine re my leg. I mean, would it be smart that the doctor actually has the information what was done with me in South Estonia, right? So we believe that if this information is shared, it actually leads to the better healthcare. And it's all digital. So what it means, yes, you can picture the screen also, but you need to get the information to the screen. So I always know who has checked my data. So I know who has checked my data. I have an example here, it's just an old, old slide, but the first one is my lung doctor, the second one is my cardiologist, and the third one is my family doctor. And somehow now we understand that being digital, fully digital and connected, is actually more privacy protective and data protective compared with the analog system you have here. And that's the whole point of GDPR. I mean, having a control over the data is actually better, like being digital and having control over the data is actually better than being analog and say, no, no, we can't connect the system because then we have a privacy problem. No, if you're analog, you are, have the privacy problem. If you're digital, if you're connected, and you can be connected because you have state control identity, beautiful and elegant. So that's how we have built it. Yes. There are some downsides. Last year, we had a huge crisis. So um, those ID cards we have, uh, those chips on the ID cards had a bug. Let's, say, let's call it bug. It had a mathematical, uh, not error, but um, it was basically quite simple to hack that card. And it wasn't only a Estonian problem. Uh, the chip maker, uh, the German company, actually had the same problem with Austrian cards, Spanish cards, many private sector cards. So there was like tens of millions broken cards. We only had 700,000. So in bigger scale, we were the minor problem. So whenever, like in the moment where it was released that there's a pr pr problem, Austria canceled all the cards, S Spain canceled all the cards, and nothing happened because Nobody uses it. But we actually use those cards. So for us, it was like nightmare because, yes, if you had a mobile ID as an alternative, fine. Let's cancel the car and let's use mobile ID, like no problem. But there was a significant amount of people who didn't have, didn't have the, the mobile, mobile ID. So uh, for us, it was a huge scandal. And uh, I mean, prime minister canceling the trip to, official trip to Poland, like, uh, uh, cabinet gathers ultra fast, like uh, basically nationwide event. And it was 
like a huge mess for half of the year because we had to replace the, the security on the cards, or we actually had to replace the, the cards, cards themselves. So it was actually a wake-up call for us. It's the same thing like, like with, if you go, for example, for a vacation, and you only take one credit card with you. And then it's stolen, and then you are screwed because like, no cash, no alternatives. So it seems to be that with identity, it's the same thing. You have to have an alternative. You don't have to have like, different digital identities. You still can have one, but you have to have different carriers. You have, I mean, I was fine because like, I was mobile ID, and it has a diff different uh, crypto on it, so no problems. Funny enough, this is the share of the company, the German company. It's the share price last year, during the year. And the scandal was through the year. And you see, nothing happened. The share price actually increased more than 50% with one year. And what it says to us, I mean, as a government or as a company CIO, you might be concerned about security and stuff. But in reality, even if the provider provides you shitty stuff, nothing happens with them. Shareholders don't care. So, and that's a boring thing, a boring fact that we, we see at the moment, that, that shareholders don't care I'm a, like, if I actually provide security or not. So for us, it was a scandal. For this company, nothing. You can see the same trend with Facebook. I mean, huge scandal with Cambridge Analytics. Share price is not even back, but way upper than it was. So who cares about security and privacy and data protection? OK, I care, if it counts. But why it's important? Why this, this caring is also important? Obviously, winter is coming. I'm coming from north. <laughs> uh, let's play a game. Do you remember how you bought music 20 years ago? What was it? CDs. It was CDs. And it was a huge improvement from cassette. Because if you remember getting the B-side song number six, it was a huge hassle. And CDs seemed to be absolutely fantastic. And like, I mean, it can't get any better. The sad part was that you had to buy the whole album, even if you liked one song. But like, and you had to listen to the whole album because nobody wants to hustle with the CDs. But I mean, it was a huge improvement compared with cassette, right? When you bought your last CD, one CD cost, cost like 15 bucks, 10, 15 bucks. So to get the decent playlist, at least 300, 400 bucks. Today, you, like in YouTube, everything is free, or like with Spotify, it's I think 6.95 or something like that, and you have the whole music in the world available for you per month. So something has been like music, buying music has been simplified, hassle-free, and what it shows to us, people actually like both with their legs. So 20 years ago, you went to the local music store. Today, the music store doesn't exist anymore because nobody buys CDs anymore. And, but you, as a customer, you don't care. The same 10 years ago. 10 years ago, let's say, if we go out from here, from this con uh, convention center, and uh, we go on the street and ask people, can you describe me a perfect phone? What do you think what people would answer to you? I mean, Apple was there, but like, not with significant sales results. So uh, most probably they would explain you that the perfect phone will be Nokia phone with a better camera. And nobody could see that like, we actually start using this device that shouldn't be called phone anymore, because the last thing what we do with this is calling. Right. Six years later, from hero to zero. People move fast if something is good. So why all this is actually connected with identity? Four years ago, I wrote an essay 
with two other government officers. Um, and I, our idea was that what if uh, Estonia becomes great again? I know you have heard that, but I mean, <laughs> truly, 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 like when 1.3 million up to 10 million. So we are 1.3 million nation. What if we grow to 10 million? Because to be something meaningful, I mean, like Sweden. <laughs> they are 9.6, that's why we wanted to be 10. And they are largest country in Scandinavia. So, but how can we get there? How can we come from 1.3 up to 10 million? So I'm an engineer. So what the engineer is doing? You take a problem, you cut it to the pieces, and you try to solve it. Okay, so from 1.3 from up to 10, what are our solutions? First of all, we can start doing babies. <laughs> That's an option. Those are mine. So I went to my wife. <laughs> we have this 10 million now. She's outside there actually having a for fun coming, but obviously that's not the way to go. Because she said to me, like, do you understand, like, if you have this goal, first 25 years, this investment is just a liability. <laughs> I mean, you should, like, if you invest into the shares, like Facebook shares, like, it, you can do way better than, than, than with those. So, not an option. Another option is what the US has used a lot, or, or Germany, or UK, it's immigration. We just bring in more people. Estonia has a huge problem. Nobody wants to come. <laughs> because like, if you are in the latitude of Alaska, I mean, like, uh, <laughs> not the best place to live. I mean, at least people from the south. And we have like, huge competition. I mean, like, in the same latitude, you have like, Norway, Sweden, Estonia. So huge social benefits, huge social benefits, no benefits. It's quite obvious, like, like, where they go. So, I mean, again, it wasn't an option for us. But thanks to this identity, thanks to the fact that we actually have been able to build all this digital society that, like, 99.9% .9 of the services are digital and you don't have to physically go uh, and visit the government officers and any private sector, like, company, everything is, can be used with digital signatures and stuff. It means that... You can serve your people, your diaspora location independently. Even voting. We have been doing internet voting since 2005. So you can actually vote over the internet since 2005. 13 years without problem. So if you live in Silicon Valley or if you live in Singapore, it doesn't matter. You can be part of the society and participate. Play your taxis, whatever you want to do. So if you can serve Estonians, globally, location independently. Who says that we only have to serve Estonians? So we came up with an idea. What if, I mean, if Muhammad doesn't want to come to the mountain, the mountain has to go to the Muhammad. So what if we create a digital identity for foreigners so they can be part of our society. They can be connected with our society as any other Estonian, except voting. What if we give them that chance? It's not a travel document, so if you have that, you can't, it's not enter, entry point to Schengen, so Estonia is a Schengen country, so you can't get into the Schengen. But what if, let's say, you're American, you want to do business in Europe, for that, you need a company to be created. You create a company over the internet with 18 minutes. You have accounting, everything done, location independently. What if there is a need for that? So, government said, full trust, please. I mean, parliament voted 18 favor, zero against. Afterwards, a journalist asked from one parliament member, did you actually understand what you voted for? No, but it sounds good. <laughs> so that's the fact. And the point is that the world is changing, and there are more and more people who actually work cross border. border. And like, there are like many people like Diego, for example, who, who provides algorithms for energy companies in Europe. And like, he has a 
specific reason like, like why he actually wanted to have a company in Estonia. So he lives in Brazil, but runs his company digitally in another jurisdiction. So for Diego, it was understandable. But we were amazed last year, the largest amount of e-residents or e-citizens are actually from Germany. And we are like, what? You are inside European Union. You are the European Union. So why the hell you need e-residency? Because it's hassle-free. For 75 euros per month, like, you don't have to do any reporting, any like, like, hassle with the government. Everything is taken care of. And you have the inter European bank account and everything. Like, so it's cheaper. Faster. And now remember the CD and the music thing. If something is cheaper and easier to handle, people will go for it. And that's why this identity play game now gets extremely interesting. Because if somebody is able to provide global identity, and this, and this identity can be trusted, our pilot shows you actually can do great stuff. Because the next generations, they don't build houses anymore, like they rent. They work one year in Singapore, one year in Europe, one year in US. They are global citizens. So who can serve them? Is US able to serve them? Or maybe it's Estonia. The numbers are huge and the numbers are growing also for Estonia. Maybe you have seen this slide, definitely, like Uber being the number one taxi company without any vehicles by themselves, or Facebook. We just have one add-on now. And I leave you with this. I mean, being digital means location independent. Location independent means who needs location. Country in the cloud, government in the cloud, and all that stuff. So, thank you. And please, keep doing babies.